There you go. <laughs> that first one was kind of a. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call this meeting of the House Finance Committee to order. Let the record reflect that the time is currently 1.05 p.m. on Wednesday, November 8, 2017. Present today, we have Representative Ortiz, Representative Kawasaki, Vice Chair Guerra, Co-Chair Seaton, Representative Tilton, Representative Grin, Representative Guttenberg, Representative Thompson, Representative Wilson, and myself, Co-Chair Foster. And before we start, please mute your cell phones. And at this meeting, we'll continue to hear HB 4001, which is the Employment Tax Bill. <coughs> and so with that, I'd like to ask uh, Department of Revenue's Director of Tax Division, Mr. Ken Alper, to please come to the table. And uh, thank you for being here. If you could put yourself on the record and proceed with your presentation. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. For the record, my name is Ken Alper. I'm the Director of the Tax Division at the Department of Revenue. Before I get started, I just want to apologize to you and the committee for this presentation didn't get to you till about an hour ago. Uh, we were asked to present sometime yesterday. Uh, getting the actual document put together was the last night exercise. Just the, the, the things that happen under the 24-hour rule are a little bit awkward. Uh, we wish we could have got it to you a few hours earlier, but uh, at least we all have it ready to go in time for the hearing. So the, the reason I'm here and was asked to come back was primarily to respond to questions that came up during the initial presentation. I was here uh, with Commissioner Fisher on October 26th. Uh, previous to that, the commissioner had presented the revenue forecast with Chief Economist Mr. Stickle. Uh, there were other questions that arose from that hearing, and we sent the committee a letter dated November 2nd responding to those questions. I'm going to go over those very quickly. I'm going to then give the committee a little bit of a refresher on the basic structure of the bill. I appreciate that the legislature has been pretty much preoccupied with crime bill issues over the last couple of weeks, and you might not remember all the details of our little revenue bill, which was two weeks ago. And then I'm going to respond to some specific issues and questions that came up in the, in the previous hearing that were raised by members. And uh, it's not, go ahead, very, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, very quickly, I just want to recognize that we're also joined by Representative Pruitt. Please proceed, Mr. Alper. So, Mr. Chairman, it's not a, not a very thick package of slides. It's uh, 22 or so, so there's plenty of time for questions. If uh, the committee members want to, want to go down some rabbit trails, I'm happy to go there with you. The, uh, the issue areas that were raised, which I'll get into, this is sort of a table of contents slide here, number two. Some labor force questions, uh, relative impact to that progressive regressive issue. Uh, the combination of the state tax with the municipal taxes and where the state of Alaska ranks uh, nationally. There's a, a, some really interesting analysis we were able to pull together. And finally, some of the technical questions on the profit distribution and tax implementation. I expect, Mr. Chairman, I'll be joined in a few minutes by Brandon Spanos. He was on a plane from Anchorage today and should be on his way in from the airport. When he arrives, he'll be here and we'll be uh, able to react to some of these technical issues that are beyond my knowledge base. Uh, so the revenue forecast, there were four questions that were highlighted and, and submitted in the letter. It should be in the committee's record. I just, uh, key points, the oil and gas tax credit appropriation formula, that 10 or 15 percent, the number that we were showing, 175 million for FY 2019. The way the statute's written, we go to the spring forecast, which is the most recent official price forecast prior to the passage of the budget in May to, to calculate that. There isn't any language for going back to actuals and sort of retroactivity. It's designed to be based on the forecast price, uh, in case members were curious about that. There was the issue of the, the transition of motor fuel tax from unrestricted to designated general fund. Although this first reached the committee's attention last year with our motor fuel tax bill, and obviously that bill has not passed, uh, the, the Legislative Finance Division decided that that might be a more appropriate use of that fund given existing statutory language, given the way that it's used. So they made an internal determination that they would like to consider it designated regardless of what happens with any new revenue bills. Uh, and we uh, concurred, OMB, the Department of Revenue, and Legislative Finance are all in agreement now that going forward, the motor fuel tax should be considered designated general fund. Uh, the third question had to do with our negative revenue from the oil and gas corporate income tax. That is a, a hard idea to get one's head around, honestly. And it primarily comes from the time lag between estimated tax payments. Uh, let's say uh, the tax year is a calendar year for that tax in 2015. 
companies were paying estimated taxes after the first, second, third quarter of 2015. By the time they paid their taxes and trued it up, it was the end of calendar year 2016. October is the payment due date. So FY17 is when any refunds for overpayments of 2015 taxes would have been paid back. So uh, because there were relatively high estimated payments in 2015 and 2014 based on uh, the, the lower prices not quite working their way through the system yet, we ended up paying back some fairly substantial refunds. The other thing that happened was that uh, legislative finance, uh, sorry, legislative audit had determined that certain additional revenue that came in should, uh, that we put in the general fund should more appropriately have been considered uh, constitutional budget reserve revenue that was the result of an audit or some sort of an administrative proceeding. So we made an internal transfer of money from the general fund to the CBR. That showed up in the year it was made, FY17, as negative general fund revenue, although Practically speaking, it was a, it was revenue neutral. It was just moving it from one pocket to another. So the arithmetic in this table shows how we got to negative uh, revenue balances for FY16 and FY17, if, uh, if members were curious. And then finally, there was a, the, a question on roughly the impact of a dollar in the price of oil. And there's a little more detail in the letter itself, but the short answer is uh, where we are today in these price ranges, the 50s, 60s, 40s. A uh, dollar in the price of oil is roughly $30 million of unrestricted general fund over the course of an entire year. So if we say, oh, it's going to be $10 higher than we thought, we could sort of mentally build $300 million into our thoughts about what we think the deficit's going to be. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Alper. I'd just like to recognize that we're joined by Representatives uh, Tallarico and Representative Josephson. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, please proceed. Um, oh, we've got a question from Rupson and Pruitt. Yeah, thank you. Just one, uh, on the 30 million there, that last piece, I, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear. It, does, is that just, is that tax revenue? Is that taxes and royalty? Is it, how, how does, what exactly does, can we base that? Thank you. Oh, Mr. Spanos is here. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Spanos, uh, if you wouldn't mind just putting yourself on the record, then as each of you uh, speak up, if you could just identify yourselves for the record. Sure. Uh, Brandon Spanos, Deputy Director with the Tax Division. Uh, Representative Pruitt, through the chair, the, the $30 million is all unrestricted revenue, so it's the production tax as well as the unrestricted portion of oil and gas royalties, the th half to three quarters that's not dedicated to the permanent fund. The, if you were to add that permanent fund money back in, it would be more like $35, $37 million, but that's obviously corpus and not spendable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Guttenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to... See if I have the right. The dollar in rise in prices is based, is a very simplistic, if it went up $1 and stayed there all year, it doesn't account for fluctuations, it doesn't account for mid-year, it doesn't account for partial year. It's just as if January 1st, the prices went up $1 and stayed there to December 31st. That's the, that's the simplest approach to just illustrate it. Am I correct on that? Uh through the Chair, Representative Guttenberg, yes, you're exactly right. It, it assumes that $1 shift for the entire year. And, and at this lower price range, you're assuming that the production tax change is really based on the 4% gross minimum tax. At higher prices, it gets a little bit more complicated. Once uh, producers are able to get into the net profit structure, that number will increase to you know, higher, more like $80 million a barrel at higher oil prices. Uh, sorry, $80 million per dollar. Uh, at higher oil prices. And we have a, a document we put out after every forecast that, that shows that stuff. We could provide it to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Seaton. Uh, thank you. Back to question number one on the first page there. Um, in the second paragraph uh, where we're talking about, and I'll just read it so that everybody uh, knows what we're talking about. However, the statute is not entirely clear whether the 10 or 15 percent, that's the tax rate, uh, should be applied to tax before or after application of credits. And the alternate mechanism calculating the percentages after application of tax credits uh, would result in smaller appropriations based on preliminary fall forecast, the $175 million for tax credits would be reduced to $46 million. Um, and do we have any further legal clarification on that right now, or are there are two alternative mechanisms that uh, 
are still both viable. So the, through the chair, co-chair Seaton, we have not asked for a formal legal opinion. Uh, the issue was not really germane until this year. The, the way we've interpreted the language going back to the FY16 budget cycle, to the 2015 session when we first contemplated using the funding formula as opposed to the previous open-ended language, it, what the statute says was 10 or 15 percent, I believe it says, of the amount received from 4355-011. Uh, for, that's the production tax itself. It's the 35 percent of the net calculation. We interpreted that to mean the tax calculation without any of the credits, including the credits that come against liability, the main one being the per barrel credit, the sliding scale credit, which is 4355-024-J. So based on that, it's a larger number that we're taking 15% of, and that gets us to the, uh, the, the 30 million that was in the FY17 appropriation, the 77 million that the FY18 appropriation was based on, and then the 175 in the forecast. If the amount was tied to the amount actually received from 011, meaning accounting for the subtraction of those credits, it would be the smaller number. Uh, the key here is the, the per barrel credit number was very low for the last couple of years because the price of oil was a little bit lower, but the difference between the two calculations might have been, let's say, $10 million. Now suddenly, if you were to take the alternative calculation and say it's the amount received after the subtraction, the amount actually received, uh, the 15% calculation gets us to the $46 million. Uh, we, obviously, the appropriation language is a guideline to the legislature. The legislature will ultimately appropriate what you feel is appropriate uh, in next year's budget, but uh, we're just sort of flagging for you that there is another interpretation to the language. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, Mr. Elper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, just to quickly get into the bill itself, House Bill 4001, uh, all members have seen this. Uh, this is a new slide uh, from me, although you saw it yesterday from Director Pitney. Just to put in scale how our uh, re revenues, general fund revenues, have declined, uh, starting with the peak in 2012, and how our expenditures have declined to react to that. Uh, although our expenditures have, in fact, dropped 44 percent from the peak in FY 2013, the, the revenue decline of, of 80 percent has led to this structural deficit that we see going forward. So that underpins part of the reason why we're here with a revenue bill. Obviously, the expectation is the bulk of that deficit would be met by some form of permanent fund restructuring, and then this bill would be the, the last bit of it to get us closer to a, a structurally sustainable, balanced budget in future years. So what does the bill do? It's a 1.5% tax, a flat rate tax on wages and self-employment income. That is a subset of what people generally think of as income. Uh, it doesn't tax such things as investments, retirement income, uh, dividends, that interest, that sort of thing. It is paid by individuals earning income in Alaska. And in doing so, it doesn't distinguish between resident and non-resident. It's earning income in Alaska, and it's a tax on individuals, meaning if you have more than one working person in a household, each would pay separately. And I say pay, not file, because generally speaking, individuals who have simply a job would not file taxes. There's a withholding mechanism. Employers would take the 1.5% from the, the paychecks just the way they withhold federal uh, Social Security taxes, withholding taxes, state unemployment taxes, it would be one additional withholding and it would be remitted directly from the employer and that data would be enough for the Department of Revenue. We would only be getting direct individual filings from self-employed people who had to calculate their own 